All right, so today we have part three of the Rogel Dorn series by Baldemord. Um, I have enjoyed this series massively. It's he is such an excellent storyteller. He is so good at what he does, and um, he's one of my favorite lore people. Period. I'm not really gonna go much more into it. You guys know, if you guys are already on this part, you guys already know what you're about to see, so let's just get started. Uh, don't expect much commentary through this, because honestly, Baltimore does such a good job that I don't feel like contradicting him. Welcome, gentle listener. I will assume you have watched the first two acts in this, my report on Rogal Dawn. If you have not, then I would gently encourage you to do so. But let us now continue with this tale. The tale of the Primarch of the Seventh Legion, the Legionis Astartes, the Praetorian of Terror. Rogal Dawn. It was soon after that that the forces of chaos discerned something. The one thing they had dreaded more than anything else. The wolf, Lehman Ross, the lion, himself, L. Johnson, and Gulliman, who commanded the largest legion, were finally, finally arriving. Their ruse was up. Their time had elapsed. Their war was over. With these forces arriving, the battle would soon shift in the favor of the Loyalists, and the traitors could well be crushed like so many sour grapes beneath the feet of the righteous. But those on Terra were woefully unaware of this. Horus kept their long-range Orspec scanners blind. The forces of Chaos, those dark guards who had set this catastrophe in motion to slay their enemy, the one man they called the Anathema, the Emperor of Mankind. They surrounded Terra with such psychic force that even the Master of Mankind could not pierce their obfuscations and discern the impending return of his mighty sons and Elysians. Horus had no choice. He made one last desperate toss of the dice. He challenged the Emperor. How did he do so from his flagship in high orbit, one might ask? Mm -hmm. Very simple, gentle listener. He dropped the shields that prevented the Royalists from teleporting up to his very decks. He made this move blatantly, so it could not possibly be missed by Rogel and his father, the Emperor. Again, the die was cast. The Emperor retreated from his war in the webway and asked his oldest comrade, Malkador, to take his place on the Golden Throne. It was decided. The Emperor would take the field personally and end this insurrection the only way it could ever be done, by taking the head of the Great Betrayer with his own hand. Rogel and Sanguinius marshaled the greatest of their warriors, and the Emperor would take a selection of his custodian guard. Mm -hmm. They prepared to teleport themselves directly to the bridge of the flagship of the traitor, to appear on the bridge with the vengeful spirit. Rogel must have felt an itch in the back of his mind, a feeling of something amiss. He knew that something was wrong, for he was a Primarch. His father was present for one of the few times he had seen him in years, due to his labors in the webway and the warp. So he felt confident. But something was amiss. The angel moved differently. Mm -hmm. His bearing too somber for one such as he. As if he were already resigned to something. His smile too warm. As if to say... But there was no time for analysis now. 
They were to assail the dragon in his lair. If he doesn't the say it, I will. The forces of the Emperor strode to their teleportarum and massed for the assault. Rogel and his hand-picked Terminator guard, heavily armored beyond even that of a normal set of power armor of the Space Marines, appeared. But the shock of the translation into the very depths of the vengeful spirit was thrice-fold and ghastly, beyond my vocabulary to describe. The walls of the vengeful spirit were festooned with eyes and mouths that screamed endless cacophonies of blasphemy of hate and pain. It was a vision of perdition made manifest, where all was degradation and twisted nightmare. Any normal mortal's mind would have shattered, and they would have ripped out their own eyes from the horror they were subjected to just by viewing this infernal scene. <laughs> Rogel saw the future of the galaxy if Horus and his dark puppet masters won out. If there was ever vindication for his struggles, he had it now, a plenty. But that was only the. F Seriously, the way that he presents lore is just, it, it, it. You know what? I have looked at this very picture about God knows how many times, but I have never seen the script down there at the orb. I have never seen the script right there and right there. I've never seen that in this picture. I love the way Baltimore story tells. I love the way he paints pictures just by tone and the words that he uses, the way that he says them. Anyhow, shutting up and continuing on. First initial reaction, no matter how deep it struck him. His shock was terrible when he realized that the teleportation had been disrupted, for he could not see a single custodian guard. He could not see the emperor anywhere. Nor could he see a sign of his brother, Sanguinius, nor his own personal guard. They had been separated. Dawn, the warrior within this man, was calm and got immediately to the work, as they were almost immediately assailed by endless throngs of perversions and traitors that were twisted beyond parody. But with a feeling that must have been akin to rising panic, Rogel knew that his force had arrived at the very furthest point from the bridge. He would have to fight his way the entire length of this vessel to reach the bridge, and potentially his brother and father. They were beset on all sides, and would have to wade through terror upon terror, abominations without count. Alas, as one of the largest vessels ever wrought by human hand, the ship was some 20 kilometers long. Yeah, and that kind of sucks. Rogel did the only thing he could and moved with the speed of a god as he began the longest journey of his life, the battle to the bridge of the vengeful spirit. His projectile weapon soon ran out of ammunition and soon he and his guards advanced, fighting every inch of the way to the bridge. Miles. But he never tired, never let a moment pause where his mighty arm was not raised to swing and slice with his trusted blade. As the seconds became minutes, the minutes became hours. The wake of blood and viscera from he and his men was without measure. The salt of twisted scum never ending. But then, something changed. Oh, how it changed. Mm. The very walls of the ship changed the pitch of their cacophony and went from shouting blasphemies to a never-ending wail of lament. <laughs> the figures who had beset them now fled and ran, screaming in terror and woe. Rogel, despite his fatigue, must have given internal bellow of victory, for only one thing could have changed the passages and their denizens so. The Emperor must have done it. 
His father must have slain Horus. The War Master was bested. The dream would rise like a phoenix, and yeah. the world would be well and right again. They had won. Oh, this is depressing now. With a fleetness of foot that can only be attributed to joy. The way now clear, Rogel charged to the head of the ship to embrace his father and his brother. Joy. All of his efforts had not been in vain. The years, the young men and women in their millions and billions he had sent to their deaths against this outrage. The toil of an entire race had been worthwhile. Humanity had gazed into the very pit, the dark gods of the warp, of the worst that could ever be thrown at them, and had spat into evil's eye. This... A new dawn. It's so happy, but when you know what's coming, it just makes you feel like ass. was about to begin. They had won. So, gentle listener, we arrive at the moment, what I call the longest second. One must remember that a Primarch, any Primarch, is a being of magnitude greater than a normal human. They had faculties almost beyond the scope of human understanding could discern things that would be impossible for a normal mortal to discern. Sherlock Holmes or Poirot could take hours of meticulous study and dissection of a situation before coming to the conclusions that a Primarch could glean in a second. Mm. And thus, with this explanation done, let us progress to the moment I have been avoiding for stalling. It is almost too difficult to narrate, no matter how many times I have tried to do so clearly. Let us see the longest second. Yeah, pretty much. I will now show you a picture that any Warhammer enthusiast, in fact, most people, will have seen in their lives, but never truly understood. Mm -hmm. For everyone thinks that they are looking into the bridge of the vengeful spirit. It is merely a painting, a description. But it is not. It is the heart of Warhammer, mm -hmm. its soul. For what is shown is what Rogel Dawn was confronted with. So harsh, so terrible. For Rogel tore back the bulkhead and was confronted with it. And in that one second, the longest second, the part of this being, the man called Rogel, died. He died the worst way a man can ever die. He died of a broken heart. The image you see contains the figures of Horus, the Emperor, and Sanguinius. You may initially think that this cannot be, as the figures are standing and the Emperor seems to be about to confront his son Horus. Mm -hmm. But give me your ear, and let me explain my reading of the content. I'd love to hear this. For Rogel, Dawn knew the fighting style, the capabilities and failings, the strengths and weaknesses of each individual therein contained. His Primarch mind took it all in, compromised it all in just one 
second. The wounds on each, the scars, the scuffs on the floor, the blasts on the walls. It painted a picture that a mere human cannot fathom. In that instant, Rogel not only saw the result of the confrontation, he would have played out every last swing of sword, every last gasp and grapple, every last action that had taken place in that room. He would know what happened, when, between whom, and how. In the longest second, Rogel saw it all. And it was the end of Rogel. Why? Because he had seen it. The end. He had seen his most beloved brother toyed with, his valor and the mild injury he dealt to a being, his own brother, Horus magnified by the power of chaos. He saw Sanguinius arrive early. He saw Sanguinius arrive alone. He saw Sanguinius's fury and desperate battle. How Horus had disbalmed him with a backward swing and then taken his gloved hand and raised him up, crushing Sanguinius's windpipe and snapping his neck, then his nonchalant tossing of the body of the angel onto the ground, hmm. like a refuse. I'm going to stop it right there. I hate to even say anything about this, but from what um, I'm understanding about well, some of the things that I've read and seen, the uh, actual death of Sanguinis was a lot more uh, violent and um, frankly brutal. Um, but I'm not going to say anything about Voldemort's style here because frankly it's, it's fucking perfect. He would have seen the Emperor then enter the room, would have known that words were exchanged. A plea from father to son to end this path. To return to him, that all could be forgiven. He would have predicted the sneer from Horus, and the offer spat back in his father's face. The clash of arms, the battle begun. He would have known the Emperor could not unleash his power, his full skill on this, his most beloved, his first found son. Horus. He would have known, seen even, how Horus had played on this and pressed the advantage. How Horus had fought and then ground the Emperor down, forever thinking he was actually the greater being. So much had the Dark Powers whispered promises of invulnerability and then heady platitudes into his ears. Horus actually thought he was toying with his father, whereas the Emperor was held back out of love. Mm. Yes, even the Emperor was capable of that. How Horus then cut off his arm. How Horus blasted his father with infernal powers and burst one of his eyes and seared the skin from his sire's face. How he took him and raised what he thought was a defeated carcass over his head and brought it down, breaking the Emperor's back. Rogel would have seen another figure, a voyeur witnessing the struggle of gods and how he interceded and stood before the Emperor's carcass. How Horus had laughed and destroyed that brave soul who stood before a god to defend his liege. And in that instant, Rogel would know how the Emperor, the father, 
would see that there was nothing left of his son to save, and how he then marshaled his power and unleashed it. Horus was near destroyed. But, like a vampire of legend, the blow had forced the evil from him, and his face returned to that which Rogel knew. His big brother, Lupukal, was gone, and only Horus remained again. Rogel would notice the tear trails on the face of Horus, and knew the regret as the scales were removed from his eyes and he had seen the horror he had caused, the billions dead, his father broken, his brother dead by his hand. How Horus would have howled in pain. And Rogel would know that the father would then have shown a kind of mercy, knowing full well that Horus could turn again at any second and become a vessel and vassal of the Dark Gods once more. But also, because he knew Horus so well, the Emperor knew him. The father knew that the son would never be able to forgive himself for the tyranny and pain he had brought to the world. So, as an act of prevention, yes, but more a last action of love. The Emperor again marshaled the last of his power and destroyed every last trace of the soul of Horus. Nothing would ever remain to be used again. Horus, his greatest and most loved son, was destroyed so thoroughly that nothing could ever be done to return him to plague the galaxy, nor to feel the weight of the pain of his actions ever again. Mm. Worse still for Rogel. Horus must have returned to the state of being that Rogel would have remembered so well. Would know the evil he was by the travesty of his armor and the surroundings and company he kept. But in that instant, Rogel would have gazed at Horus, the Horus he remembered, the uncorruptible titan of hope and justice. But with no even hint of his soul remaining. Such a cruel vision. For now he could not be elated at the destruction of a twisted foe. He would have to mourn all over again the loss of his closest and respected big brother all over again. Yet still there is more. I have stated before that from my reading of the Lord that Rogel believed, he believed in the Crusade and the Emperor and the Imperium. Mm -hmm. He believed that his father had no choice in his action and that the only way to save humanity was for him to take control directly, despite knowing he was revealing himself to the dark powers of the warp, and that they would never tire from their quest to destroy him. For they wished humanity be their plaything, and banquet for all time in perpetuity. Rugal believed more than any Primarch, but in this room he knew the Imperium died. Or if any of the three people... He is, that's loud, he is an amazing storyteller. And I wish they would just hire him on to do some audiobooks. Because I'd listen to this guy read the fucking phone book. ...were destroyed had lived. The dream of the Imperium could continue and be healed. The Emperor was its king, its architect and protector. Horus was its greatest warrior and held the dream sacrosanct before his corruption and truly understood the dream and how to fight for it and what it was for, the salvation of humanity. And Sanguinius, he was its very soul. He exemplified all that was best and brightest in humanity. 
He was the shining promise of the future. Sanguinius was the Imperium. He was the goal. So that one day all humans everywhere across the galaxy and beyond could be as he. Sanguinius was a promise made manifest. It was a result of the Crusade and the Imperium. Only Conrad was not present. Horus was to win the Imperium. Rogel was to build the Imperium. Sanguinius was to be the Imperium. And Conrad Curse was to protect it and enforce its law. But Conrad could not match the power of the darkness within him, the darkness that was the Night Haunter. Thank you for and bringing me And he had fallen so long ago that Rogel had forgotten. But now he was reminded. But without them, without its philosopher general, without its soul, without its king, the dream was lost. Rogel could not do it alone. Rogel also knew, all in this one second, that without the Imperium, his race was doomed. It would not be immediate, but it was now inevitable. He witnessed not only the death of his father, his brother and his hope, his dream, and his reason to continue. Rogel saw the very future of humanity, its death, all in this one second, the longest second in fiction, mm. the longest second any human had ever experienced. Boy. I honestly can't wait to see how this plays out in the Siege of Terror books. I am waiting on this. Ever will. But it still continues. The torture for Rogel kept on and on. For many theorized that the Emperor gave something of himself to every one of his Primarchs, but, in my view, that denuded him of those emotions, these feelings. When Rogel went to find the broken body of his father, he knew he was alive, but only barely. And Rogel looked into the Emperor's one remaining eye and saw it. For I believe the reason that the Emperor of Mankind kept Rogel close was because of the very faith he had. He believed in the Imperium so very much. He believed in the dream. So when the final word was to be received, when Horus was to send the greatest of all communications, the word that the Crusade had finally done what was thought impossible but seemed so probable, when the Emperor left his most able son in charge, the completion of the Crusade, the final message that stated, Mankind is now safe. I believe, like a jaded old man, world weary, and now incapable of experiencing joy, because he had given up so much of himself to his Primarchs, his sons. He had kept Rogel close, just so he could look into his eyes and see the joy contained therein. <laughs> so the Emperor of Man could bask in his son's elation like a father at Christmas. Hmm. Instead, the Emperor looked at the reflection of his broken body and saw that only Dawn stared at him. He witnessed the death of Rogel, and Dawn would have seen that reflected in his Our Father's eye as well. The pain passed back and forth, the loss unfathomable and magnified as they stared. The death of humanity was now certain. From the very jaws of salvation, defeat and extinction now loomed. 
inevitable is the rising of the sun. The dark powers had won. No matter that Horus had been defeated, they had won. So Dorn brought his father back to Terra and took down his final instructions, his final plans. But both knew they were but forestalling the end, grasping for the path that would lead to the longest death rattle for humanity, the Imperium, and the Dream were dead. Dawn then placed his father in the machine known as the Golden Throne, mm -hmm. the life-extending and power-magnifying alien object that would... Again, I say again, this guy... This is... It's watching a movie, he puts it... He puts it so well together. Just the way he introduces the stuff. It's... And it's a story I know backwards and forwards, but I love hearing it in the way he's putting it out there. Maintain him until the 41st millennium, 10,000 years later. But never truly alive. Always teetering on the edge of death, holding on for the sake of his race, but never able to recover, repair, or save his life and the hope he had for his people. Dawn found that his brothers had arrived, that the Blood Angels and his own sons had charged the enemy lines when the advent of the death of Horus was plain to the entire demonic and traitor hordes, that they had fled from the righteous wrath, and that the Blood Angels had felt, had felt their sire die. Dawn took his men, led his remaining brothers, on a crusade of wrath and of penitence. For although Rogel was gone, Dawn, the warrior, was ashamed. He was so guilty that he had fought so hard for so long that the very last had failed his rage was called, and he exacted butchery from the butchers and chased them all to the edges of space and then finally into the eye of terror over a campaign of years. The scouring. When Dawn returned from his great campaign of vengeance. All right, as I was saying, um, the one thing I was going to talk about if he didn't say it was Sanguinius knew this was coming. He had the same foresight as Conrad Curse, and he knew who he was who was going to kill him. He knew when it was going to happen, just like Conrad did. And he accepted this. He accepted his fate. So we're going to see if this actually, because there's still a lot of speculation up in the air about the final fate of Sanguinius, as it's going to be in the Siege of Terror books. I can't wait to see what it's going to be. You hear... Very angry pug puppy. Very angry. In any case, here we go. Well, he found that he had been supplanted. For not all evil is warp generated. Not all wrongs are from without. The warp was only a reflection that collected and magnified the evil within the hearts and minds of those in the corporeal world. The amplification of jealousy. Reboot was left in charge of what was left of the broken Imperium. To give him his due, Reboot organized well and restructured and defended humanity, while Dawn and his brothers performed the scouring. But Reboot had elevated himself had become enamored of his own authority. Which surprised absolutely no one. With too long without anyone to gainsay him. So he supplanted Dawn, the man who had taken the last instructions from the Emperor before he ceased to speak. 
and gain such authority that to disagree with Reboot was seen as treason. When Reboot Gilliman produced his Codex Astartes, a document that stated that no man should ever command such power of a legion of Astartes again, and that all of the legions should be broken into units of only 1,000 men, the chapters. He stripped Dawn and his brothers of their only remaining reason, to take from them their very sons. Dawn declared he would not do it. Never. Naval ships under the re All right, give me a second. That thing's very angry. I need to go pay it some attention. She's calm now. In any case, back to it. The reason that Dawn had defied Reboot actually fired on one of the Imperial Fist's vessels. Yeah. Dawn was facing compliance or another civil war. One that would hasten the expiration extinction of the human race. Dawn took himself into seclusion and used an item only known as the pain glove to inflict untold pain on his body so that he could meditate in peace. Yeah. Dawn came out of that meditation with a simple decision. His sons would not be parted from him and would not bow to reboot Gilliman. So they had to be sacrificed. They had to undergo their own pain glove. They had to atone. They would go to a place, a trap, known only as the Iron Cage, which I will describe in more detail in the future, if I can gain the heart to do so. Hmm. And there, in the trap laid by Poterabo of the Iron Warriors, specifically made to taunt Dawn, he attacked, knowing well that, like Abraham, he sacrificed his sons to death in the name of the Emperor. Mm. For Reboot would brook no challenge, and would not trust another Primarch to ever wield the power of a legion again. And so they died. Perhaps they would have all died, if Galliman had not led his marines, his ultramarines, to the site and intervened to save the last of them. The shame of it. But Dawn was a Primarch only now. He would not feel the shame that Rogel would have. Affronted, yes. The shame, no. For, in my reading of the lore, I suspect that Dawn took the sons of Rogel and allowed them to be slaughtered to see if there was anything of Rogel left. Any last vestige of the man who dreamed a dream of the future. If anything remained of Rogel. The uh, adult pug is sitting here. He does not want to leave my office. He wants to sit in here and uh, basically look at me with doom and gloom eyes. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Yay. Well, he would awaken then. Or not at all. Dawn was satisfied. There was nothing left of him. Rogel was dead. Only Dawn remained. The legion remnants were then broken into the chapters of 1,000 men that Galliman demanded. Some records say that only three chapters were possible. So few of the Imperial Fists that were left after the Iron Cage. The Imperial Fists were the first thousand, the Crimson Fists the second, and the Black Templars the last. Only three thousand sons of Dawn from nearly a hundred thousand at the beginning of the heresy. Yep. Other reports state other things, but we shall go through them in a different time. Dawn went on to fight against the enemies of the Imperium, and it is said that he was ferocious, but without mercy or pity. Mm. For these were traits of Rogel, not Dawn. And Rogel, Rogel, he was left on the bridge of the vengeful spirit, forever experiencing that longest 
second. Perhaps it is better this way. Dawn was said to have been killed on a traitor's ship when they burst from the Eye of Terror, the warp, in one of their many raids into real space. There is con some contention over this from fans, however. The only thing that was left was his hand. Since then, his sons, the Imperial Fists, have kept it as a sacred keepsake, an icon left on the phalanx his mighty vessel of war, and the Imperial Fist's home. Each chapter master has since then scrimgeored their name upon the very bones of the hand of Rogel Dawn. One there are theories that this is not the ca- One second. <laughs> the interruptions, the more, Like, I got through the first 30 minutes, no problem. <laughs> These last 15 minutes are- forever case and the dawn may not be dead and exists on terror in the palace he didn't watching over the husk that is the body of the emperor of mankind i personally can think of no worse fate for this son for this man for if rogel had truly lived then he would have had to watch his dream his dead dream decay day by day, mm -hmm. year by year, century by century, like a parent watching their child decay in front of them, yeah. never being able to look away, never being able to gain one single moment of respite. This theory I cannot bear for the legend. The hero, the man who fought so hard for so long and nearly, so very nearly, prevailed against half of his brothers, those demigods, practically single-handed. It is too grimdark, even for me. So I hope Dawn did die on that vessel, fighting. Despite the fact that it would have been suicide by chainsword, hmm. by the hand of his enemy. For Dawn would never be killed by the likes of them. I hope this with all my heart. He is such a good storyteller, it just, it baffles me. But, um, yeah. I had intended to leave the story there. Oh. As that is what is known and canon, as many say. And after eating, sleeping, dreaming this tale for so long, I was desolate. To do what I hope you agree is really get inside the shoes, the skin of Rogel. I had to bend my entire will to his existence, his experience, his perspective, his life, and his pain. My deepest woe was for a man, such a man as Rogel, to give up, to give in. To end the story, defeated. This great titan who had endured so much. So desolate was I, I could not see how I could continue to do this if the byproduct was such emotional disruption. But then I read the comments section <laughs> and was enlightened. So for one last time, put your hand in mine, gentle listener, and let me take you on another journey, 
Let me tell you what this bard thinks has happened, or will, in the future. For I realized I was wrong in my reading. The story of the Warhammer world does indeed mutate and progress. Once, the idea that a Primarch would return was laughable. They were only background to add verve to the setting, but not so now. We have been told that they will all return in their own way, but comparatively soon. If this were the case, then how could this be managed? How could the Primarchs have been gone so long and done so little while all of this time had passed? Then I took the one word, just one word, from a fellow fan called Seladrin, Dina. And it all fell into place. The Corvus Corax went into the Eye of Terror. Jagatai went into the webway. Vulcan appears to defeat the beast, but then inexplicably disappears again. Russ goes into the warp, and the lion sleeps. So much I still believe is true, but Raboot has returned. Dawn is reported dead, only his hand remaining. But what if? Just what if Black Library and Games Workshop intend to tell a different story for a new century? They have mentioned Raboot having a round table. The king lies crippled and dying, and awaits a cure. How very... Arthurian. <laughs> what if Horus is not Satan, as some state? What if he is Mordred? What if Rogel was not Michael after all? What if he is Galahad? But what if Rogel is not dead? What if during the Pain Glove experience, his father contacted him and showed him he was not dead either, just crippled as some state? What if Rogel still believes? Can anything stop this man when he believes? Not really. What if the Master of Mankind sent Rogel, his Galahad, the only Primarch left he could trust with this task? A quest. A way out. A cure. What if Rogel spoke to his brothers? What if they agreed that one of them had to remain to guard the Imperium? Reboot would be the choice, but he did not trust them. Perhaps they feared that he would try to stop them, liking his power and position too much to surrender it, even to its rightful lord. Perhaps that is unfair. And they just did not wish to burden him with their knowledge. Each of the Primarchs has gone into a separate realm, for even a deep sleep, as mm -hmm. in the case with the Lion, can be said to be another realm as well, mm -hmm. the Realm of Dreams. Vulcan, to return, just to save the Imperium, then vanish again, and in one of the most modern books, he has stated to a son of Dawn that he will tell his father about him. <laughs> Did the brothers, led by one man, the man who spoke last with their father face to face, ask him to put down his quest just for a time, and when the danger of the beast was averted, to return to their number and quest again? What if Rogel led his brothers again as he once did, and they are the knights looking for the Grail? Utterly ungrimdark ghouls, may say, but why not? I never said they would succeed. For me, I like to think now that Rogel is still alive, not just Dawn, and that Rogel is searching for that cure, that grail that will rejuvenate the Emperor and allow him to take his place on the throne once more to lead humanity and restore the dream of the Imperium. For I believe that there is only one person who could do this. Not a god, not a Primarch, but a man. A man who believes. 
Rogel. So in homage of this dream, I would ask that the battle cry of those players of the Imperial Fist, Black Templars and Crimson Fists, match my own. For if you believe, then do not shout his clan name. For it is the man, not the god, we should lord. Shout not for dawn. Reach for your paintbrushes. Reach for your glue. Reach for your <laughs> dice and join me. If you believe, then echo my words. For humanity. For the Imperium. For their Emperor. But most of all, for Rogel. Absolutely just impressive. Just, like I said, I really can't say that much when it comes to anything Baltimore puts out because his presentation is so good. The way he just, ah, oh, just, I wish I had half of his ability to put forth, to put out lore like this. I'm not going to say much else. Um, this has been a great series. The last one in the series is actually going to be live stream. Not a panther convinced me to live stream it. It's actually going to be the first thing that I do live stream. Um, I'm planning on going out and getting the cords that I need um, tomorrow uh, after I get off of work. And then at some point tomorrow, I'll set up a live stream to start in about 30 minutes. And I'll be coming in to hang out with you guys and watch the actual Crimson Fist video. But until then... I'll see you guys next time. Subscribe if you haven't already. My Patreon's down below, as well as all his information. Catch you guys next time.